A Surprise Visit, Chapter V One day I closed the door and turned around to see my father standing there. I was always a bit scared of him because he used to punish me a lot. At first I was frightened, but then I realized I didn't need to be scared. My father looked old with his long, messy, greasy hair and thick beard. His skin was very pale, almost like a ghost. He wore old, torn clothes. His boots were so broken that his toes stuck out. He sat down, looking at me with a serious face. He had climbed in through the window because it was open. He started to talk about my clothes and how I was acting like I was better than him because I went to school. He didn't like that I was learning to read and write. He thought I shouldn't act like I was better than him just because he couldn't read or write. The widow told me I could learn, I told him when he asked who allowed me to go to school. He got angry and said the widow shouldn't interfere. He told me to quit school and not to act superior to him. He reminded me that no one in our family knew how to read or write before they died, including my mother. He made me read a book aloud to show him I could read. After a little while, he slapped the book out of my hands, scattering it across the room. He warned me to stop trying to be different and threatened to punish me if I kept going to school. He picked up a picture I had earned for doing well in school and tore it up, telling me he'd rather give me a punishment than a reward. He complained about the comfortable life I had, saying he had to sleep in much worse conditions. He kept complaining about how people said I was rich, which he didn't like. He demanded money from me, thinking I had a lot, but I told him I didn't have any. The next day, he went to Judge Thatcher to try to get money and made a big scene. The judge and the widow tried to become my guardians to take me away from him, but the new judge didn't want to separate families. My father was happy he could keep me. He said he would make sure I learned not to act above him. He borrowed money from Judge Thatcher, spent it all, and caused trouble until he was arrested. After he was released, the judge tried to help him change. He invited him to live at his house and treated him kindly. My father promised to change his ways and be a better person. The judge and his wife were very supportive. But one night, my father sneaked out, traded his new coat for alcohol, and got very drunk. He fell off the porch and hurt himself badly. The judge was disappointed but still hoped to help him change. My father promised he would never return to his old ways. Life on the Run with Pap, Chapter 6 After some rough days, Pap was back on his feet. He wasn't just physically active again, he was also back to his old ways, challenging the law and everyone around him. He was determined to sue Judge Thatcher to force him to release some money, money that he believed was rightfully his. And he wasn't too pleased about me continuing my schooling either. Despite his threats, I kept on attending school. I dodged him whenever I could, which wasn't always easy because he would catch me occasionally and punish me for disobeying him. I was scared of him, sure, but I also started to feel a kind of stubbornness that made me want to defy him just to prove a point. The lawsuit against Judge Thatcher dragged on without much progress. It seemed like it might never even get started. Every now and then, when Pap got particularly menacing about needing money to stay out of trouble, I would borrow a few dollars from the judge. Pap would take this money, spend it on liquor, and then cause chaos in town. After his drunken escapades, he'd inevitably end up in jail, which seemed to suit him just fine as he was always quick to stir trouble. His constant harassment became too much for the widow. She warned him to stay away, threatening to make his life difficult if he didn't. Pap was furious. He vowed to show everyone that he was in charge, especially me. One spring day, he caught me off guard, dragged me into a skiff, and rowed us three miles up river to a secluded spot on the Illinois shore. It was a dense, wooded area with no one around for miles except for an old, abandoned log cabin hidden deep in the forest. Pap decided this would be our new home. He kept a close watch over me there, making sure I never had a chance to escape. 
He locked the cabin at night and kept the key under his pillow. He had stolen a gun from somewhere, and we lived off the land, fishing and hunting for our food. Occasionally, he would lock me in the cabin while he went to trade our catches for whiskey at a store near the ferry, three miles away. Despite our isolation, the widow somehow found out where I was. She sent someone to rescue me, but Pap was ready. He chased the man away with his gun. I had to admit, after a while, I got used to the quiet life in the woods. It was simpler and less bothersome than living at the widow's with her constant nagging and the endless need to follow rules. As the days turned into months, my clothes turned into tattered rags. Surprisingly, I found myself missing the structured life at the widow's less and less. I had stopped swearing because the widow hated it, but now, without her around, I picked up the habit again. It was one of the many small rebellions that made life with Pap bearable. However, living with Pap wasn't without its hardships. His temper was unpredictable and violent. The beatings became more frequent and severe. One time, he left me locked up in the cabin for three days. I was terrified he'd drowned or abandoned me. The loneliness was overwhelming, and I decided I had to escape. I had tried to find a way out many times before, but always failed. There were no windows large enough to climb through, and the chimney was too narrow. The door was made of solid oak, nearly impossible to break through. Pap made sure to leave nothing sharp or useful behind that I could use to aid my escape. But one day I discovered an old, rusty wood saw hidden between the rafters. I used it to slowly and quietly saw through the log walls of the cabin. I was nearly done when I heard the sound of Pap's gun nearby. I quickly hid my tools and covered my tracks. Pap returned more sour and irritable than ever. He complained about everything going wrong in town and how everyone was against him. He was convinced that another court case was coming, one that would likely end with me being taken away and placed under the widow's care again. That night, as Pap drowned his frustrations in whiskey, I made up my mind. I was going to leave, no matter what it took. As he lay there, Passed out and snoring, I prepared to make my escape into the wilderness, far from Pap and his tyranny. An Unexpected Discovery, Chapter 7 Get up! What are you doing? The sharp voice of Pap woke me from a deep sleep. The sun was already up, and his face looked serious and a bit unwell. What are you doing with this gun? He demanded, his eyes fixed on the firearm by my side. I realized he didn't remember his actions from last night, so I quickly made up an explanation. Someone was trying to break in. I grabbed the gun to protect us. Why didn't you wake me up? He continued, looking puzzled. I tried, Pap, but you were sleeping so heavily that nothing I did could wake you, I replied, hoping he would believe me. He grunted in response, then instructed me briskly, Enough talking. Go check if there are any fish caught on our lines for breakfast. I'll join you soon. After he unlocked the cabin door, I hurried out along the riverbank. I noticed some small branches and bark floating by the river was rising, which was often a good sign for me. During the rise, valuable driftwood and sometimes whole logs would float down the river. These could be collected and sold for a good price at the sawmill in town. As I walked, watching for both Pap and any useful driftwood, a beautiful canoe caught my eye. It was about 13 or 14 feet long, floating gracefully and empty. Without hesitation, I dived into the river, swam to the canoe, and climbed aboard. I expected to find someone hiding in it, playing a trick as people often did but it was genuinely abandoned. Thinking about how much the canoe might be worth, I decided to hide it instead of taking it straight home. 
If I chose to run away, this canoe would be perfect for traveling quietly down the river. I paddled it to a secluded spot, a small creek shielded by overhanging vines and willows, and carefully hid it there. Returning to our fishing spot, I checked the lines. Pap hadn't come down yet, which gave me time to think. We had a good catch five catfish, enough to fill our bellies. We ate well, and both of us, worn out, decided to rest a bit. As I lay there, thoughts of escaping from Pap's harsh ways filled my mind. I needed a solid plan to keep Pap and the widow from following me if I decided to leave. Pap, waking briefly, mumbled a reminder. Next time someone prowls around, wake me up. I would have shot him. Make sure you wake me next time. His words sparked an idea in me about how to cover my tracks when I left. By the afternoon, as the river brought more driftwood past us, a sizable part of a log raft floated by. We used the skiff to drag it ashore. Normally we'd wait to gather more, but Pap, ever impatient, decided to sell what we had. He locked me in the cabin and left with the raft. Once I was sure he was far enough away, I began my escape. I packed the canoe with supplies, cornmeal, bacon, a jug of whiskey, and other essentials. I even took all the ammunition, the fishing lines, and matches. Everything I could need to start anew was with me. I carefully erased any signs of my departure, making sure nothing looked disturbed. Once everything was ready, I quietly paddled the canoe away from our landing spot, heading down the river under the cover of twilight. My heart was racing with the excitement and fear of the new life that lay ahead. Floating silently down the river, I felt a mix of freedom and uncertainty. The river, wide and serene under the moonlight, was now my path to a new beginning. I planned to travel far enough that Pap would never find me. Maybe I'd settle down in a quiet spot or keep moving until I found a place that felt like home. As the night deepened and the stars came out, I lay back in the canoe, the gentle rocking of the river lulling me. It was the first time in a long time I felt at peace alone but free, on a river that carried me towards a new dawn.